Welcome. Uh, my name is Nancy Kalick. I am the interim director this semester for the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. I'm happy to see you all at 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, on a cold Friday, no less. Uh, I'm also very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ramzi Qasim, who is Associate Professor of Law at the City University of New York, where he directs the Immigration and Non-Citizen Rights Clinic. Professor Qasim has litigated high-impact cases stemming from wrongful convictions and police misconduct, served as legal consultant for the International Center for Transitional Justice, and works on legal and policy responses to the September 11th attacks and other national security crises, as well as the rights of minorities and non-citizens and international humanitarian law. With his students, Professor Qasim represents prisoners of various nationalities, presently or formerly held at American facilities in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, at Bagram Air Base, of, Air Base Afghanistan, at so-called black sites, and other detention sites worldwide. In connection with those cases, Professor Qasim and his students have appeared as party counsel and submitted merits briefs before US federal district and appellate courts, the US Supreme Court, and before the military commissions at Guantanamo. On top of all that, Professor Qasim also supervises, uh, supervises the Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility Project, the acronym for that is CLEAR, which primarily aims to address the legal needs of Muslim, Arab, South Asian, and other communities in New York City uh, or in the surrounding area, particularly affected by national security and counterterrorism policies and practices. Before joining the CUNY Law Faculty in 2009, Professor Qasim was Robert M. Cover Teaching Fellow and Lecturer at Law at the the law school at Yale, sorry, where he taught in the Civil Liberties and National Security Clinic, as well as the Worker and Immigrant Rights and Advocacy Clinic, and has also pre previously served as adjunct professor of law at Fordham University School of Law in New York, where he taught the International Justice Clinic. Today, uh, the lecture that we'll, ha that we'll have is entitled 9-11 Warping and its Discontents, Our Security State, Racism, and Foreign Policy. Thank you. Please help me uh, welcome Professor Qasim. Thank you, uh, Nancy. And I'd like to thank uh, not just Nancy, but the entire staff uh, at the center uh, for their gracious hospitality and for their patience with me. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you for coming out on a, on a Friday afternoon. So um, I wanted to start with this. Um, remember 9-11. It was the day that everything changed. We will never forget. All too often, uh, we have repeated or read these and other phrases unthinkingly, almost reflexively. Uh, but what precisely changed after the attacks of September 11th, 2001? The question is basic, perhaps, but important all the same. Certainly, our militarized response to the attacks with the invasion of Afghanistan uh, may not have been the sole viable option, but it was also uh, far from surprising. After all, the post-Cold War 1990s had begun with an unabashed display of overt US military interventionism during the Gulf War. Um, and the rest of that decade, too, bore marks of America's penchant for uh, that mode of participation in world affairs. Think of Somalia, think of the Balkans. So what, if anything, is new about the post-9-11 moment? The answers matter because without an understanding of what exactly may have changed, uh, we won't be able to properly size up the challenges and develop critiques and responses that actually uh, hit their mark. The fiery deaths of thousands of fellow New Yorkers shocked and scarred me as it did others who lived in the city on that day or who have ties there. But it also bespeaks the depths of American privilege that we are able to live so sheltered and apart from the indiscriminate political violence that marks the everyday lives of millions of other human beings worldwide, including violence meted out um, directly by our own government or with its support in various forms. So shaken were most of our compatriots in their sense of invincibility and their national optimism and in their faith um, in American exceptionalism that they became vulnerable to all manner of demagoguery. Our privilege then was a factor, enabling a collective trauma so profound that it made plausible the notion of a constant, omnipresent, almost supernatural threat. In turn, this made mythical prospects of total security particularly appealing uh, to officials and to members of the public alike. It's important to pause here and to caution against that species of conspiratorial thinking which conflates outcome with intent 
or design. That state actors may be perfectly willing to take advantage of a particular historical situation by rolling out specific domestic or foreign policies does not necessarily mean they endeavored to bring about that situation. Be that as it may, the distorting effect of formulating policy through a total security prism is nonetheless real and pervasive. It can be seen in the warped functioning of already existing systems and in the creation of new systems, all in the name of national security. And the warping of existing systems and processes was immediate in the wake of the September 11th attacks. The slide, the slide you see here um, summarizes from the U.S. Department of Justice's perspective what happened in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks. There was a wave of immigration roundups nationwide. According to um, the Attorney General and according to the U.S. Department of Justice's Inspector General, 1,200 immigrants were detained in the two months that followed the September 11th attacks. Now, those are the jailers' figures. Um, immigration advocates have counted up to 3,000, so different organizations have had different counts. But anywhere between 1,200 and 3,000 immigrants were detained immediately after 9-11. And you'll see from this chart that the detainees are uh, the crushing majority of the detainees hail from uh, Muslim majority countries or uh, countries with a significant Muslim population. In addition to that wave of detention that swept nationwide but concentrated in certain urban areas with high immigrant populations like New York, New Jersey, like those kinds of air urban areas, in addition to detention, there was also a sweeping campaign of questioning by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, where again, according to their figures, upwards of 8,000 individuals were questioned in the weeks that followed 9-11. The overwhelming majority of those people, you can imagine, were also either American Muslims or immigrants uh, from hailing from Muslim-majority countries. In addition to those two measures, there was also a program called Special Registration, specifically NSEERS, the National Security Entry Exit Registration System. Um, the countries, uh, the nationals of certain countries basically had to register. Male nationals of certain countries uh, between the ages of 18 and 40 um, had to register and had to submit to questioning by federal agents on a periodic basis. Uh, the, the countries in question are um, Muslim majority and Arab countries, um, as well as North Korea. And, and this, by the way, seems to be a meme in American racism. I, I, I remember once uh, as a law student doing death penalty work in Louisiana and visiting um, the, Louisiana State, the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola. It goes by Angola. And when you, when you go and visit there, and, and, and you should, if you're in Louisiana, I would, I would recommend visiting that prison. Because what you'll see there, and they, and they run tours. They even have a rodeo, a yearly rodeo. But what you'll see there when you're on the sites, it's a maximum security prison, you'll see chain gangs. Uh, you'll see white men with shotguns on horses watching over chain gangs of five prisoners. And invariably, it'll be four African-American prisoners chained together and one European-American prisoner. And, and I was talking to one of the assistant wardens there, and he told me pretty you know, plainly that 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 person, that one white person on the chain gang, is referred to internally as the balancer. To, to, to avoid the uncomfortable scene of a sort of slavery-like, plantation-like situation. Because actually Angola, the site itself for the prison, was formerly a plantation. And so in this, in this setup, North Korea becomes the, the balancer of sorts in this particular chain gang. Um, so ten, tens of thousands of individuals registered through the NCR Special Registration Program. Um, and in one year, Nearly 14,000 of them were placed into deportation proceedings. Um, none, none of them, by the way, were deported in connection with terrorism offenses. Uh, so it was just basically exclusion on uh, grounds of national and ethnic or, national or religious origin. So I will share, I'll, I'll share one personal story, actually, that in my view captures the, the climate that reigned in those detention facilities and jails immediately after the 9-11 attacks. Because what they did was they quickly ran out of immigration 
Uh, they quickly ran out of beds in immigration detention facilities. So they had to scramble and find jails and penitentiaries uh, where they could house these people in the New York and New Jersey area. Uh, and the U.S. government was not disclosing the names or the identities of the detainees. So at that time, I was a law student, and I volunteered with attorneys at the American Civil Liberties Union uh, to literally go prison to prison and to try to interview some of the immigration detainees. Some of them were being held in general population and were being abused by fellow inmates uh, with guards turning a blind eye in the name of you know, patriotic duty. Um, and so I was at one facility in New Jersey, and I had gone in with the ACLU attorney we had conducted a day's worth of interviews with uh, some of these immigration detainees, trying to get their names, trying to get their identifying information so we could take it out into the world. Uh, and then we had wrapped up our day of interviews and we were walking out. And the way you walk out of that facility is you have to go through some kind of an antechamber, and they close the door behind you and then they open the door in front of you and you head out. So the attorney that I was with went into the antechamber, they closed the door, they screened him and then they let him out. And then I walk into that same chamber and they close the door behind me, except they don't open the door in front of me. And so I'm, I'm standing there for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes and I can see them through the glass. I can't hear them, but I can see them sort of looking puzzled and, and you know, pouring over their charts, uh, their, their, their little logbook, looking at video. And I can also see the attorney from the ACLU basically s screaming and like gesticulating. So I figured what was going on by the time I got out, uh, it was confirmed that the, the people in the prison actually thought that the ACLU attorney brought in a suit, gave the suit to a prisoner, and that I was that prisoner trying to escape with the attorney. And, and they wanted to confirm by looking at the, you know, the footage that I had actually walked into the prison with the attorney. So that was the climate we were in um, after 9-11. Another, another major expression of 9-11 warping is found in the national shift towards a, a sharply preventive um, law enforcement paradigm, supplanting the, the, con the more conventional, mostly retrospective model. So in, in a quest for precursor conduct and predictive models, both the FBI and the New York City Police Department, for example, embraced the theory of radicalization that posits the existence of a conveyor belt relationship between increased re religiosity on the one hand and violent political action on the other. Federally, the FBI's race and religion biased questioning campaign, which, as I mentioned, began right after 9-11 continues to this day, 2016. Uh, one development greatly facilitating this variety of over-policing came in 2008 when the U.S. Department of Justice's guidelines for domestic FBI operations were revised under the then Attorney General Michael Mukasey. In, in the new version of the guidelines, the FBI no longer has to demonstrate uh, a criminal predicate uh, to an investigation, which effectively gives agents the authority to spy on anyone uh, for as long as they wish, even if that individual has never committed a crime or is not even considered a suspect in formal terms. According to government data, in the first four months after these rules were instituted in 2008, federal agents launched uh, nearly 12,000 such low-level inquiries known as assessments. The photo you see here is uh, a Know Your Rights workshop uh, with my students at, at CUNY Law School, who, my students who are in the CLEAR project at CUNY Law School, uh, we do these Know Your Rights workshops literally every week. Um, and, and the concern about the FBI's uh, questioning, the fact that FBI agents can show up at your doorstep, that they can embarrass you in front of your neighbors or show up at your workplace, embarrass you in front of your colleagues and your employers, uh, to ask you questions about your political viewpoints. What do you think about the Arab Spring? What do you think about the Sisi regime? What do you think about the U.S. war in Afghanistan? I'm not making any of this up. Uh, since 2009, we've represented over 200 individuals who have been questioned in this manner by FBI agents and, and NYPD detectives and members of other agencies. It's essentially ideological mapping. And the concern is so widespread that my students and I at CUNY do workshops like this every single week in different community sites. This one is in Brooklyn. It's a youth center. Um, and by the way, a lot of times when we start these workshops, we'll pull audience members about whether they know of or have heard of someone being approached by the authorities for questioning. And in many communities, in most communities actually, the overwhelming majority of hands in the room will go up when we ask that question. So today, as a result of all of this, the FBI deploys an estimated 15,000 informants, mostly in American Muslim communities nationwide. Um, these informants do not play the typical role 
uh, that informants have historically played or are supposed to play in law enforcement investigations. When you think of informants, you think traditionally of an informant as the eyes and ears of whatever agency is deploying them. Uh, the informants in these cases are more like uh, agent, uh, agent provocateur. They're more, they're, they're more there to instigate so-called plots. Uh, they're not just the eyes and ears of the government. They're also the pockets and the hands and uh, everything else. The, you know, they, in a lot of the cases, the so-called terrorism sting cases that you may read about in the media, you should ask yourself, how active was the informant in that case? And when you look closely, you'll find that the informant was not just there to spy, but actually comes up, suggests the idea of the plot, provides the means for its execution. Uh, so it's, a, it's an elaborate setup, and, and, and what should really uh, sort of be a tip-off that it's an elaborate setup is, is when you read the, uh, the press releases that the Justice Department puts out in connection with these cases, oftentimes they'll say the, the public was never in danger, right? Which tells you that there's a level of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, that it's contrived to an extent. So I wanted to also show you um, Mr. Craig Montale, who you see here. He was one of these 15,000 FBI informants. He was deployed uh, in, a, in a Muslim community in uh, Southern California. He befriended men and tried to go to the gym with them, men from that community, and tried to bait them into conversations about topics like jihad. He, uh, you know, he even slept with unsuspecting women in the community to gather uh, intelligence, supposedly. Uh, he would call people on their cell phones and whisper jihad into the phone. Um, it's so outrageous that there's actually a hilarious This American Life episode about him called The Convert. You should look it up. Um, so community leaders at some point in that community decided to report him to the FBI. Um, <laughs> what tipped them off that he was actually an informant is that the, the head of the local FBI office that the community leader spoke with for like 15 minutes on the phone, and you know, this community leader was describing to him all the different outrageous things this man was doing and saying. Um, what did the FBI supervisor say? Thank you very much, got off the phone without even asking for his name. So at that point, they started to think, all right, well, maybe, maybe he's actually working for them. And they eventually sought a restraining order against him. The FBI has also broken new ground in its reliance on uniquely aggressive tactics to coerce community members into becoming informants. I'll tell you the story of four of our clients at CLEAR that my students, my colleagues, and I represented. Um, one of them, they're all U.S. citizens. One of them is originally Yemeni, two are originally Pakistani, one is, an original, is originally from Afghanistan. Um, they were approached by FBI agents separately from each other. They live in different places. And uh, the FBI agents asked them to uh, become informants, essentially. They, they asked them to go and spy on their, uh, what was going on in their mosques, to report on what the imam was preaching about, report on what other people were saying in the community, report on the immigration status of various board members and the organizations that they belong to. Um, they asked one to go online and act uh, like a quote unquote radical. They asked a third client to report about the Desi community, uh, like the South Asian community in New York without getting more specific than that. So all four of our clients independently of each other said, look, you know, we, if we saw any crimes being committed, we'd be the first to report those crimes to the authorities, but we're not comfortable acting as spies within our own communities for our own personal, political, or religious reasons. So basically, they said, no, thank you. Um, the next thing they knew, when they went to the airport to try to travel overseas to visit their families, uh, they were denied boarding. And they found out that they were essentially, they had been placed on the federal government's no-fly list. And, and shortly after these attempts at traveling, the same agents came back to them and said, see, if you had, if you had just cooperated, if you had played ball, then maybe you wouldn't be in this position. Uh, and in fact, if you change your minds, if you decide to work for us as informants, then maybe we can do something for you. Um, and so that's, that's what happened to, uh, to our clients. And, and the no-fly list that I'm talking about is, uh, is just you know, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, you know, federal watch lists. What you see here is, is uh, a graph you know, depicting at least our understanding based on information that's currently public of what the watch list looks like. And, and you know, there's literally thousands of people on these watch lists. And what characterizes really the single most important defining characteristic of these federal watch lists is not only the, the complete opacity, the lack of transparency in which these watch lists are operated, but also the complete absence of process. 
Uh, there's no process in and no process out. You're not told that you're about to be no-fly listed. You're not told that you're about to be selectee listed and given an opportunity to contest whatever reasons the federal government may have for wanting to watch list you. Uh, and you're not given an opportunity to defend yourself and get yourself taken off. It's completely arbitrary. It's completely unilateral. Um, a racketeer wrote, the historian Charles Tilley, is one who creates a threat and then charges for its reduction. So my students, my colleagues and I, and our clients, thought that this was a form of racketeering, of extortion. And so on behalf of, on behalf of our four clients, we sued. Four days before a major court appearance on the case, the case that we brought on behalf of these four men who were placed on the no-fly list in retaliation for their refusal to become FBI informants, four days before our first major court appearance on that case, we got a call from the Justice Department attorney representing our clients. Um, and she essentially said, all four of your clients are now off the no-fly list. They can all fly. Um, and this is a photo of the lead plaintiff in the case, uh, Mohammed Tanvir. The case is Tanvir v. Comey, uh, with uh, the two students from CLEAR uh, at CUNY Law School who represented him. Um, this is a photo of him at the airport. After having been put on the no-fly list for over three years, uh, he was not able to visit his wife and children overseas or his sick grandmother. So he was about to finally be able to do that after we got notification that he had been removed. But, but what, what that taught us, really, was that there was never any aviation safety-related reason for his no-fly listing in the first place. It was just another manifestation of 9-11 you know, warping with FBI agents utilizing the tools at their disposal for all sorts of improper purposes, like pressuring people to become informants. I'll give one more example on this front. Sneak and peek warrants under the USA Patriot Act were issued nearly 2,500 times between October of 2006 and October of 2009. Only 1% of these sneak and peek warrants were used in terrorism-related cases, which was the purpose for which that provision and the entire USA Patriot Act was, was enacted. 69% were for drug-related investigations. Since 2009, it's been difficult to obtain more data on how these warrants are being used, but I would imagine that you would find a similar skew. So we should all keep in mind that, that, that we're also probably only seeing the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the warping of the FBI's policies and, and functions. And federal authorities, by the way, are not the only ones moving away from and stretching traditional modes of operation. The NYPD engaged in a vast domestic spying operation targeting Muslims for surveillance, mapping, and infiltration. Stretching from the heart of New York City to the border of Canada by way of Connecticut, New Jersey, and Long Island, the program was as massive in scope as it is in ambition. In the name of total security, the NYPD treated basic acts of daily living as potential crimes disregarding privacy and the freedoms of speech and religion. This was done with the help of former and current CIA officials, by the way, who helped start the NYPD's spying program. Uh, and that partially collapses traditional boundaries, uh, legal and practical, between foreign and domestic spying. One branch of the program focused on so-called ancestries, uh, so ancestries of interest, which included New Yorkers from 28 predominantly Muslim countries, so think Syria, Egypt, Iran, so on and so forth, as well as, quote, the American black Muslim. That program yielded such gems of intelligence as the following. A black Muslim male named Musa was working in the rear of the store, reported one covert operative canvassing Long Island businesses. Another sleuth saw fit to report, without a hint of irony, that the Al Jazeera News Network is not shown at a Brooklyn Tea Room, quote, because the owner feels it brings about extra scrutiny from law enforcement. This, this is, uh, and, and again, I'm not making any of this up. I mean, there is, there is an online Zagats that was compiled by NYPD detectives uh, who were members of the so-called Zone Assessment Unit, earlier known as the Demographics Unit. That's a part of the NYPD's Intelligence Bureau. They literally went to every single restaurant, hookah joint, bar, cafe that was Muslim, identified, owned, affiliated, and created these little um, book reports. I don't know what you want to call them. <laughs> Actually, there's a funny story by the Associated Press about how some of these detectives kept on going back to this one kebab joint on Main Street in Flushing, Queens, Kabul Cafe, which I know very well because the law school, CUNY Law School, used to be on Main Street in Flushing, and I used to go there a lot. 
they know what they're doing over there, and apparently our detectives in the NYPD have a good taste in food, because there was absolutely no law enforcement related reason for them to go there, but they would just keep on going and billing it to the NYPD and getting takeaway. <laughs> because the, the kebabs are just like, you know. I mean, they are, they really are. Uh, so, so, yeah, so this is the sort of thing they were doing. And what all of this should make plain, I hope, is that you know, it's important to discern the color of surveillance, so to speak, its disparate effect. Since 9-11, American Muslim communities have borne the brunt of these particular policies. To members of those communities, the methods and tactics of surveillance signal that, in the government's view, one can only choose between two postures, being compliant or a threat, serving as an informant or a terrorist. Either way, as a Muslim in America, one is always a target for cultivation or for surveillance. As a result of all of this, we, uh, we brought another lawsuit which, uh, which was recently settled this year, um, or we announced the settlement this year, uh, awaiting court approval. The lawsuit was Raza v. City of New York, and it was a lawsuit that we brought on behalf of a number of individual plaintiffs, mosques, charitable organizations in the Muslim community in New York City who had been targeted by the NYPD sweeping surveillance program. And it was a constitutional challenge, and, and the, the theory was twofold, that it was a violation of their First Amendment rights uh, to, to freely practice their religion, for them to be surveilled in the way that they had been by their own police department, and that it was also a violation of the constitutional guarantee of equal protection, uh, for them to be policed in ways that other communities had not been policed. In addition, and, and we just settled, we just announced the settlement of the lawsuit in January, and the settlement is awaiting court approval, uh, but essentially a number of re reforms have been put in place uh, to try to rein in what the NYPD has done since 9-11. Since um, in addition to the distortion of existing systems, what we've seen with the FBI and the NYPD and the immigration roundups, 9-11 warping finds another major expression in the development of entire systems geared towards the exercise of control and domination. What you see here is, uh, you know, by now infamous photo taken by an Associated Press photographer on um, January 11th, 2002, which was the day that the first plane carrying prisoners landed at Guantanamo, at a time when the US military didn't really have its act together, I guess, and allowed photographers to take these sorts of photos. Nowadays, um, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow this sort of access to any reporter. Um, among, among these prisoners, we, my students and I uh, at CUNY represent Maaz al-Alwi, who's a Yemeni national, uh, who by his internment serial number 28, you know he was on that first plane that arrived at Guantanamo. So he may be among the men seen kneeling in this photo. We just can't identify him, obviously, because of the uh, masking and, uh, and goggling. Um, so so I, I put this photo up here just to remind everyone of the, the, shadow, the shadowy global detention network that the US government stood up in the wake of 9-11. It included places that were, I guess, more in public view like the prison at the U.S. Naval Station at Guantanamo Bay, uh, like its larger counterpart, the, the prison at Bagram in Afghanistan near Kabul, which the U.S. military no longer operates. But it also included uh, less overt uh, facilities, like the CIA's uh, black sites, which you know, we now know were in countries like, there, 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 were, there were two black sites in Afghanistan, but also Poland, Thailand, Romania, and a number of other countries. The military commissions also, despite their superficially recognizable shell, since there have been military commissions before in the history of American justice, uh, but these military commissions, the ones connected to Guantanamo, are a novel construct in, in substance and operation. This is a photo of, uh, of uh, from the left uh, is a student, one of my students at CUNY Law School who's working on a military commissions case with me. We're down at Guantanamo, this is the entire uh, defense team for one of our clients, including the military lawyers and the military paralegal. Um, and we were at Guantanamo to defend this man uh, in front of the military commissions at Guantanamo. His name is Ahmed Darbi. He's a Saudi national. He's holding a photo of his two children, uh, one, of, one of which, his son, he's never met. He was abducted in Azerbaijan uh, when his spouse was uh, still pregnant. He was rendered unlawfully to Afghanistan where he was tortured at Bagram and eventually rendered unlawfully again to Guantanamo without any process where he remains today. Um, the, the re, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna sort of make sure to highlight the, 
the most important aspect of all of this, which are the, the human impact. Um, because Mr. Al Darby was presented for trial before a military commission, uh, which is essentially a, a, any prosecutor's wet dream. It's a, I mean, I think the, the, the criminal justice system, the, our normal criminal justice system, tends to be skewed towards the prosecution, as, as many of you probably know. The military commissions are even more so. Um, they, they allow for the admissibility of coerced evidence, uh, weighed for probativeness against prejudice. So in the case of Mr. Al Darby, who was uh, significantly abused at Bagram, um, you know, statements that were taken from him, self, you know, potentially inculpatory statements that were reportedly taken from him at Bagram, could potentially be admissible against him at a military commission at Guantanamo if the military judge decides unilaterally that um, the treatment he was subjected, subjected to did not amount to torture or cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and that it was only coercion. If it's only coercion, in the military judge's view, then the judge can decide whether it's more probative than prejudicial and allow it in to be used against the defendant. Think also of the CIA's dramatic foray into what they euphemistically refer to as kinetic action. Um, their use of armed drones uh, to unilaterally execute, extrajudicially execute, uh, people who are placed on a kill list by the National Security Council. Those people are all overseas. They're mostly uh, citizens of other countries, but they have also included U.S. citizens overseas because the Obama administration, which has dramatically expanded and embraced the use of extrajudicial executions by use of drones, uh, the Obama administration has maintained that legally it has the right to place an American citizen and citizens of other countries on these kill lists as long as they're overseas. Um, and at least that's significant an illustration of the generative and transformative power of 9-11 warping is the government's development of a global surveillance capability that is uh, totalitarian in its scope and ambition. This is one of, um, this is a slide within a slide in a way. It's the NSA's PowerPoint slide that we have courtesy of uh, Edward Snowden. And, and you'll see that it spells out their philosophy of surveillance, including what has become a mantra within the NSA, we're told, collect it all. Um, and, that, and that is exactly how they go about their operations, uh, collecting um, all signals, all data from Americans, non-Americans alike. The, the human rights and civil liberties implications of what we've just reviewed together are, manifold, are manifold. First, the combination of pervasive surveillance with opacity is particularly damaging to the rule of law and to any ordered scheme of governance in an open society. The government seeks total visibility into the lives and even the protected activities of citizens and others. At the same time, it veils its surveillance actions behind a curtain of secrecy reinforced by rules that it deploys in courts and in response to requests under freedom of information statutes. The result is a great degree of government penetration of private conduct uh, with little public oversight or accountability. Indeed, even, even on glancing review, we're reminded that our independent judiciary does not shine in times of real or perceived crisis. For those individuals affected by the warped po policies and practices mentioned, to the extent that they enjoy any access to the courts, um, and you know, individuals who are droned overseas enjoy no access to the courts, it quickly becomes apparent that even for those who do have some access to the courts, that whatever recourse or remedies may have been available are also warped and diluted in this post 9-11 moment. Staying on the topic of surveillance, legal challenges must contend with the toxic combination of discretion and deference in this realm. The judicial manifestation of 9-11 warping couples executive discretion with judicial deference to that executive discretion, effectively collapsing the judicial branch into the executive and turning what is supposed to be an independent judicial inquiry into a largely political determination. Antithetical though discretion and deference might be to foundational US uh, you know, political principles of distrust, separation of powers, checks and balances, uh, they have still taken root in the adjudication of surveillance, rigidly limiting the promise and possibilities of legal recourse. In criminal proceedings, the uniquely oppressive pretrial and post-conviction confinement conditions uh, and sentencing enhancements applied in terrorism cases in federal courts nationwide provide another poignant illustration. Uh, those affect hundreds of families at this point. If, if, if you're a Muslim charged on uh, terrorism charges in a, in a, in a federal case, uh, you're going to be placed in 
under special administrative measures which limit your ability to communicate with the outside world, you're going to be placed in solitary confinement, which uh, you know, international medical and legal experts say after a week of solitary confinement, your mental health deteriorates steeply. And I've seen this with uh, many of my clients at Guantanamo who have been placed in solitary confinement and many of my clients here in the United States who have gone through bouts of solitary. Um, even for those who might look to the courts for civil remedies stemming from what we plainly see in retrospect as knee-jerk discrimination, victory is unlikely. Take the 9-11 detainees, the, th the thousands that we talked about who were rounded up on pretextual immigration violations in the immediate wake of the 9-11 attacks. When one of them, Javed Iqbal, a Pakistani national, argued that his imprisonment and abuse were the result of impermissible official discrimination on grounds of race, religion, national origin, which seemed to be a straightforward claim given what had happened to him, um, his case ended up uh, before the Supreme Court. The case was Iqbal v. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, the case was Iqbal v. Ashcroft. The justices didn't deem his um, claim of discrimination so straightforward, though. In fact, they deemed it implausible to ascribe discriminatory intent and motive to official decision makers. You might ask why. That's because, in their view, the September 11 attacks were perpetrated by 19 Arab Muslim hijackers. It seemed to matter little to the justices that while the hijackers were Arab Muslim members of Al Qaeda who were present on US soil with valid visas, Mr. Iqbal was a Pakistani, not an Arab, with no demonstrated ties to any militant organization who was here trying to make a modest living as a cable repairman. In, in dollars and cents terms, these various expressions of 9-11 of warping amount to, um, amount to a vast investment by the intelligence, military, industrial complex, and domestic and international wars on terror. Uh, what you see here is the NSA's brand new collection center in Utah uh, that gives them the means to fulfill their, uh, their promise of collecting it all. It's where they're going to store all of your data and everyone else's data, or they're already doing it. Uh, it's a sprawling infrastructure in the ideological as well as the physical sense, which was built and depends on the Muslim terror threat. By keeping that specific threat narrative alive and looking for new ones, um, this immense system helps ensure its own survival. And when I say new ones, when, when, when we started, when my students and I started representing individuals at CLEAR in 2009, for a number of years, pretty much all of our clients were, uh, were Muslim identified. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've begun to see you know, a new breed of clients. Uh, we don't just represent and serve Muslim clients and communities anymore. We've had clients walk in who are animal rights activists. We've had clients walk in who are environmental activists. We've had clients walk in who are uh, anti-war uh, activists, uh, all of whom are now being subjected to the same sorts of methods and practices that were originally rolled out and applied to the, the Muslim demographic. So the self-fulfilling uh, self prophecy only forms a part of the portrait. The, the expansive infrastructure of the wars on terror has spawned ideologies and approaches that wield considerable transformative potential themselves on a systemic scale. As we saw, the CIA and NSA are now employed domestically to perform policing functions, while overseas they meet out increasingly military measures, identifying human targets, and, oper and operating drones to drop bombs in so-called kinetic operations. At the same time, politicians and a segment of the public clamor for a greater military role in domestic adjudicatory and law enforcement matters, defending the prison at Guantanamo, promoting the use of military commissions, and pressing for mandatory military custody over domestic terrorism suspects and the stripping of their rights as civilians before a civilian uh, court. What has grown organically out of this vast, complex, and global web of post-9-11 policies and practices begins to resemble an internally coherent project of excluding, exceptionalizing, and eliminating Muslims for political and monetary gain. It should come as no surprise that concrete material factors promote the proliferation of, ide of ideologies, including racism. Historically, here in the United States, identifiable con constituencies stood to gain from slavery and from the elimination of the land's original inhabitants. That material reality set the stage for the spread of a racist, white supremacist ideology that enabled and sought to legitimize the pursuit of those material interests, that the ideology may outlive the economic interests it originally arose to serve, that it may take on a life of its own, 
rooted in the hearts and minds of poor and powerless people who you know, may stand to gain nothing economically from its adoption is hopefully far from a controversial population, uh, sorry, controversial proposition at this point. So let me close with the following um, snippet because I find it hilarious. Um, from a recent news report about the head of the TSA getting fired. What they, uh, what they explain in this article is that you know, the, uh, uh, the head of the TSA was fired by the head of the Department of Homeland Security because you know, checkpoint screeners failed to detect mock explosives and weapons in 95% of the tests that were carried out by undercover agents. I find this to be a pithy and elegant demonstration of two propositions. One, that the threat is to an extent exaggerated, and two, that total security itself is a myth. Um, and that last realization of the unattainability of total security, to me, suggests two possible paths ahead of us. Uh, the first would be to keep feeding the beast, carte, you know, continue to give carte blanche to our government here and abroad, uh, jeopardizing the lives and prospects of countless people who find themselves on the business end of government policies and practices or weapons here and in foreign lands. Um, and the alternative that I want to raise for your consideration would be to strive for greater restraint and a more responsible and measured role in world affairs. The parties with an interest in the preservation and entrenchment of our warped status quo are organized and they are well resourced. If there is any hope of overcoming them, we must first understand and, and we must persuade others that the main guarantor of our individual and collective safety is seldom government, but really more often the goodwill of others. Um, so on that, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close, and I look forward to the conversation with Nancy and with all of you.